On the day that Prime Minister Keating and the Labour Party was returned to Canberra, an article came out right in the front page of the Australian, in bold print, a box right in the middle, which said the latest surveys show that 85% of the Australian people have never heard of the Constitution and that 66% could not name one House of Parliament in Canberra. <clears throat> Which means that we have raised at least 25 years of school leavers who've never heard anything about their own system and don't know how it works. And when you've got that type of environment, you can sell anything because nobody knows what it is that's being lost. This is a simplified version, but this is what we used to teach our kids round about the age of 14 in a series of books called Civics, the best of which was written by a West Australian by the name of Professor Walter Murdoch, which I think came out in 1920. Every child leaving school knew exactly how the system worked, how the Senate worked, how the parliamentary system worked, what the Constitution said. They had a working knowledge of their own system. So we're going to go through this. And you'll notice up at the top, obviously, is the crown, about which there's all this argument. And the first thing I think we need to say, <coughs> say about the crown is that it is in the crown's name that the title deeds of Australia are held. Your little home, your property, your business, the states, the commonwealth, all the land in Australia is held under the name of the crown according to the constitution. The second point that needs to be said is that when federation occurred, title deeds never went to Canberra. They were left in the hands of the state governments. They have nothing to do with Mr. Keating under the constitution. If he's trying to move in now, it is under a provision that is not within the written rules that the people agreed on. Now, what basically we've had in the Mabo decision is a breathtaking change about a case which has been taken before them about six or seven times. And the latest decision, which split the High Court, I might tell you, was that the Crown was no longer in charge of the title deeds, it reverted to the original owners, the Aboriginal people. Don't construe this as an attack on Aboriginal people. It's not. It is simply a statement of the legal position, which raises some enormous points, because we've now been thrust into a debate on the terms of tenancy. The legal position is that non-Aborigines are the tenants of a land owned by the Aboriginal people and some agreement must be reached between owners and tenants. Who will make that agreement? Mr. Keating would like to make it and according to his statement which came out just the other day he is going to impose his decision over the states. That was the front art page article in the Australian, PM plans to impose Marbo law on the states. There's only one problem with that. That any decision that is made must ultimately be ratified by a court of appeal. And according to the Constitution of Australia, the final court of appeal now is the High Court. It used to be the Privy Council which was a Commonwealth Court that could hear the final appeal if it was necessary, which the Labour Party removed under the argument that we should have the final Court of Appeal here in Australia. And there's a lot of justification for saying that is so. But the latest decision has brought into being another Court of Appeal, which is outside Australia, and that is the World Court in the United Nations. Because in 1987, the head of the Aboriginal Legal Service in New South Wales, Mr. Paul Coe, who incidentally is the man who has filed a claim for one third of New South Wales just recently, took a, court to the, took a case to the World Court, or tried to get a case before the World Court in the United Nations. Would they adjudicate over land rights? And the World Court said, no, we cannot do that. It's not in our province because your High Court in Australia says that you are not the original owners. That there was something called terra nullius. In other words, there was no organized system in the nation 
at the time that Captain Cook arrived. But the High Court has now reversed that decision, which means that the World Court, under an international convention on this issue, which is the International Convention on the Right of Indigenous People, can adjudicate and is in a position to adjudicate on any matter regarding land rights in Australia. So even if finally there is some agreement between groups of Aborigines and other groups on land tenure, there is no saying that the World Court will necessarily agree with that. They can overrule anything Mr. Keating happens to want or Mr. C Court happens to want. It's raised huge issues. Issues which I might say many Aboriginal people do not want to deal with. Witness the tribal elder here in your own state who recently said, look, we're filing far too many sacred sites. Many of them are not sacred sites. The Department of Aboriginal Affairs has gone mad. You might have seen that in the paper. And at many of the meetings I speak to, the Aboriginal people said, we don't want to be put in this position. We're being used as pawns. Many of them will tell you that. But then there is another thing that we need to think about. If you go back to this document and look at the preamble, and this is the year 1900 when we all formed federation, it says this. Whereas the people of New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Queensland and Tasmania, humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God, have agreed to unite in one indissoluble federal commonwealth under the crown. That was the opening statement. There were a number of different colonies which already had their own parliaments, already had their own flags, agreed to pass some of their powers across to a new government that was going to be started in Canberra. West Australia is not included in that list because at the time of federation, West Australia hung back. They weren't sure if they wanted to be in it. They came in shortly afterwards. But by that time, the words had been affixed and they weren't actually included in it. That does not mean that you're not part of Federation. You are. But that was just the, te the technicalities of what happened. You had a referendum in this state in the 30s about whether you should pull out of Australia, which was carried by a big majority of West Australians. The only reason you didn't do it was because somebody pointed out that when you'd come in, you'd agreed to unite in one indissoluble commonwealth under the crown. Indissoluble means it cannot be broken. The only way it could have been broken was by a physical rebellion, if you want to put it that way. And the West Australians weren't going to do that. So the thing was allowed to lapse. But it seems to me the key is that that indissoluble federal commonwealth is only a reality if you read the next three words which says under the crown. What happens if the Commonwealth is no longer under the crown? Is that valid or not? Let us suppose that the West Australian government now took a case to Australia's High Court which said this. According to the very ruling that you have made in the Mabo decision, those words under the crown no longer apply, which invalidates the preamble to the Constitution and therefore allows us to take the option of reverting to our original position before federation took place. How would the High Court answer that? I can't tell you this because it's, at the moment it's obviously hypothetical. But I'd have thought there's a legal case there somewhere. In other words, we've got the ingredients in this situation for incredible conflict, which I pray does not take place. But we need to be conscious of what is involved. Well, let's go on from there. That was the first thing. The crown is the body which up till now has held in trust our title deeds, freehold or leasehold or crown land or whatever it happens to be. And out of that, we then evolved a system which is very unique and can only be found in certain parts of the world, which is based on three pillars. The first of which is our legal system. The second of which is the area where our constitution was born that deals with personal sovereignty and freedom. And the third pillar is, the, is our parliamentary system, each of which is important and unique and has given us a tremendous country. Just take our legal system. Until quite recently, we had a system of common law. To understand common law, it's best symbolized by three statues you'll find on the courts on the roof of the Royal Courts of Justice in London, if you go there as a tourist. 
The statue on this side is a statue of a king in British history called Alfred the Great, who stands for, or, or who gave the English-speaking people their first legal system, which consisted of ten commandments out of the Bible. That was the first legal system the English-speaking people ever had. And even today, he is referred to as the father of English common law. Statue on this side is a king in the Bible called Solomon, noted for his wisdom, who stands for a unique part of the, our system, which is that the courts and the judges must be totally independent of the politicians. Big joke. <laughs> the principle being, and it took us a thousand years to discover this, that the best role for the crown was to hold to something called the separation of powers. The argument being, if you ever let a group of politicians have all the power, you're back to dictatorship. Split power up and spread it out and compartmentalize it and make sure it does not become corrupt. And the figure in the center, quite obviously, is the figure of Christ. And in this, in this particular instance, he stands for part of the law, which is the spirit of the law. What does that mean? Well, the spirit of the law is what turns a written legal system into a true justice system. And if you disregard it, you're gone. And people say, well, I I'm not sure I understand that. I thought all you did was pass laws through Parliament and write them down, and that's the legal system. Yes, you've got to have written laws. But the old principle used to be not too many. How do we know that? Because Scripture tells us the law shall be written on the hearts of the people. Anybody remember that? And they get, used to get the people together twice a year, if you go back and study it, and read the laws to them. And then say to them, okay, now you've heard it, don't break it, because there's no excuse. But what do you do when you get to our situation where we've got over three million laws? Which apparently are not enough. Because we're increasing them at the rate of two acts of parliament and five regulations every 24 hours. Day in, day out, day in, day out. Nobody knows how to stop it. No lawyer understands it. No politician even reads the bills that are passed now. They're going through too fast. The thing has become so top-heavy that we're in danger of being crushed by law. The spirit of the law is the ingredient we're now losing, and it works like this. Imagine two people brought before a judge on a charge of murder. The worst crime of all. If you're going to go by the written law, you simply pick up the book and you go through until you find him for murder. Used to be hanged by the neck until you're dead. Now it is a few years in jail been watered down, but nevertheless, appalling. Are you going to give every murder the same penalty? If you go by the written law, you've got to do that. But the judge can bring into the court a whole realm of things that come under the spirit of the law. He can take into account um, extenuating circumstances. He can take into account uh, provocation. He can take into account uh, motive. He can take into account uh, provo you know, all the range of things. It happens these two murders are different. One man has premeditated his crime, selected a victim, murdered him for profit. The other one, in the heat of the moment, has hit somebody over the head, perhaps for a fair reason. He might have been defending his wife and kids, and he's hit this character too hard and he's got a corpse on his hands. It's murder, all right. But do you give them both the same sentence? The written law says yes. The spirit of the law says different penalties for different degrees. So, taking into account pre-planning, motive, premeditation, provocation, this one's going to get a much tougher penalty than that one from the judge. How do you write that in a book when every case is different? So, to get a fair justice system, you need three things. Everybody with access to it, instead of just for the rich. Two, you've got to have a small number of written laws so that everybody understands what they are. And three, the spirit of the law is what turns it into justice. And we're losing the whole thing. The first principle being the courts and the judges must be independent of the politicians. And people say, look at the Fitzgerald Inquiry in Queensland. Look at WA Inc. Look at the National Crime Authority. Look at what happened in South Australia. Look at Victoria or New South Wales. There was a time it would never have happened because the Australian people would never have stood for that. The church leaders would have spoke out, ordinary people would have complained, but as we produced generation after generation didn't know the principles, we lost it. And now the game is, as soon as you get into politics, you try and get your mates into the courts. 
so that they will bring down judgments that favor your political program and you politicize the whole thing and lost the point. How did Lionel Murphy walk out of Parliament into the High Court? How did the Liberals do the same thing with Garfield Barwick? It's not just one party, they've all done it. And we've lost respect for our courts. Second principle comes under the onus of proof. You'll find this hard to believe. There was a time where in Australia you were innocent until proven guilty. Anybody remember that in the old days? It's just about gone now. The reason we took that came from the Christian faith. There are large area of the, uh, areas of the world have the opposite. You are guilty until you can establish your innocence. It's called Napoleonic or Roman law and you'll find it right through the Islamic world. You'll find it in Russia. You'll find it in Latin America. Ours came from the idea that the individual drew his liberties and freedoms from God and not from the state and you couldn't just take them away without a valid reason. Only some proof out of this came the Act, Habeas Corpus, 1604, that said you couldn't be held in jail without fair trial. Within a set period of time, it's part of Australian law, although it was passed in Britain. We've got people in New South Wales, I don't know what the situation is here, have been in jail two and a half years waiting to get to court. What happens if they're innocent? You just say, sorry, old chap, bad luck. And the last principle, and this is to me the most important, there had to be a minimum of two witnesses would come into court to give evidence against the accused person so the accused person knew who was accusing him and could defend himself and cross-examine his accusers and in a case establish his innocence if he could. And that was to get rid of a diabolical type of law that is now coming back into Australia largely from the United Nations, always sold with high-sounding names the new human rights legislation against discrimination, human rights material against uh, sex abuse, human rights material in defense of the rights of the child. And people think that sounds marvelous until you find out what it means. What it means is this, that you can get a phone call on Monday morning. Is that Mr. Smith? A complaint has been lodged that you are a racist or you um, sexually molested somebody. So you will appear before our commission on Monday morning down at such and such an address in Perth or Brisbane. Oh, am I being charged with a crime? No, not at this stage. Well, if I'm not being charged with a crime, I don't think I'll come, thank you very much. I'm not obliged to unless I'm being charged with a crime. Well, you might think that, but if you don't get there on that time, uh, $5,000 fine or six months inside? Oh, well, I think I will come then. <laughs> Can I bring my lawyer? No, you're not allowed legal defense because this isn't actually a trial. Could you tell me who accused me? Who made the allegation? Sorry, you're not entitled to know that. So you turn up without any idea what this is all about, no legal representation, and they start cross-examining you. Without ever revealing who made the It just might be a jealous neighbor who dobbed you in for all you know. You say, can I be sentenced? Well, we're not actually going to do this. You will go to court if we decide you'll go to court and all the hearing today will be used as prima facie evidence against you. So it is part of the trial. And some of the abuses we're now getting need thinking about very carefully. Don't get me wrong. Child abuse is a foul business. But we're getting people accused of this who are not allowed to defend themselves. Take the case of two parents they had in Adelaide not so long ago who came home and discovered their 15 year old daughter was missing and they were in a panic they went to the police no we don't know where she is but they happened to meet another couple of parents who had lost their kids and they met more parents and more parents and more parents and they ended up in the Adelaide town hall with a meeting of 2,000 parents who discovered their kids had been removed under this type of legislation by a social welfare department that said they'd been abusing their kids. Now, what was the nature of the abuse? These parents had told their 15-year-old daughter she was to be home by midnight, which I would have thought was a bit late. And she had discovered in a lesson at school that that was an infringement of her rights and could complain and was immediately taken away from her parents they were not even informed this had happened or where she had been taken and were never told. There was such a backlash, 60 minutes to the program on the situation in South Australia that finally the government backed off a bit. The legislation is still there. 
And it's happening in a number of fields. The couple here in Perth, who were taken before the Human Rights Commission by a, a young girl they sacked on the grounds that she had been sacked because she was four weeks pregnant. And so they had to go and they had to prove they didn't even know she was pregnant and she had been dismissed because she couldn't do the job. And finally, the court agreed that was the truth. But it had cost them $30,000 to prove it, which was never refunded to them. <coughs> you see, under the guise of giving people one set of rights, you take away a whole series of other rights. I don't know whether you saw today's paper, which is going to be a crime if you smack your kids. Yes. Yeah. Well, heaven help us. My father would have been in jail for at least a hundred years. <laughs> you see, we're losing the principles which took a long time to set up and when we made them work, they did produce a degree of justice. This is being replaced under high-sounding propaganda that in the end is going to destroy us if we don't watch out. Second area is what you could go broadly call our area of personal freedom and the idea is that every person, man and woman, has part of their life does not belong to the government or the state or the politicians or the bureaucrats or anybody else, it's yours. And that comes from a teaching of Christ which came out in the words, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. You've got to have some government, but render to God what is God's. And when Caesar begins to intrude into what belongs to God, watch out because he ends up thinking he is God. <coughs> now you think of the things that we take for granted that are no business of the politicians. What you're going to study at school, what you're going to be when you grow up, who you're going to marry, where you're going to live, how many kids you have, what church you worship in, whether you do worship in church, what books you read, <coughs> what newspapers you study, where you go on your holidays, what car you drive. What business is that of the government? And people say, don't be absurd, everybody knows that. Do you know there are countries that don't have those rights? Do you know there are countries that even have to have a license to have a second kid? So it is that part of your life which the, cr the, the crown is there to defend. And nobody quite knows how this works, except that if you think about it, the crown is not put into office in an election. Thank goodness. Imagine an election on who's going to be the crown and candidates running about saying, I'd be the best one, vote for me. The crown is put in in a Christian service in church where whoever it's going to be, the king or the queen, kneels down and these words are addressed to her, whoever is greatest amongst you shall be the servant, the words of Christ. And the idea is if any person has this part, this private part of your life attacked, the crown will defend you. Now, the Crown can't ride out on a white horse personally to defend everybody in Britain and Canada and New Zealand and Australia, so they have instrumentalities for the purpose. If our nation is attacked, the armed forces will defend us. Have you noticed that the few armed forces we've got left still have the Crown on their uniform? Why? Because under the Constitution of Australia, the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces is the Crown. Section 68 of the Constitution. If we became a republic, who becomes Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces? Field Marshal John Dawkins? <laughs> it becomes absurd when you start thinking in these terms. If your civil liberties are attacked, the police shall defend you. All right, we get the odd policeman who's not too hot, but on the whole, the police do a tremendous job. Under pretty grim conditions now, they are attacked the whole time. Have you noticed that every policeman has the crown on his uniform? Why? Because the, the police have always come under the crown, not directly under the, under the politicians. If ever we reach the stage where the police, the armed forces, and the courts all came under the politicians in Parliament, what would be the difference between that and what they had in the Soviet Union? which has been trying to get out of that dictatorship ever since 1917 and finally the country broke up to do it. And the third area is our parliament where instead of just voting a group of politicians in and saying right you've got three years go for your life 
We say to our politicians, or we used to say, you remember you are the servants of the people and our representatives, answerable directly to us, not to your party whip or anybody else. You are answerable to the people who pay you and you're supposed to represent their policies in Parliament. That's why you're a representative. And so we gave them a constitution that belongs to us, not to them. And it can only be changed with our permission when we have a referendum and we've got to have a majority of Australians in a majority of states before one word of that is changed. And that's why the politicians try and get rid of it the whole time, because it restricts them from power. And then we split them up into different groups. We have a lower house, the House of Reps. We have an upper house called the Senate. And then we actually have the Crown in the Parliament. People say, that's nonsense. Is it? Well, just have a look at the opening words of the Australian Constitution. The legislative power of the Commonwealth shall be vested in a federal parliament, which shall consist of the Queen, a Senate, and a House of Representatives. People say, I had no idea the Crown was in the Parliament. Yes, it is. It's not allowed to make any laws, and that's a good thing. That's done by the representatives of the people, but the Crown is the umpire. And if the people's representatives get off track or do something corrupt or become bogged down in inertia, the Crown can actually sack them from office, which has happened more than once. But notice one thing. When the Crown does that, it doesn't, doesn't keep the power itself. It gives it back to the people and says, you have another vote because it belongs to you. And so long as you've got an umpire, that can make sure the people have another vote and can change things round if they want. You can never have a dictatorship. Every dictator wants to get rid of restrictions. Well, basically the proposition for a republic is remove the umpire. It's like batsmen going out to play cricket saying, I'll umpire my own performance, thanks very much. <laughs> You see, there's much more to this than meets the eye. This system of lower house, upper house, and crown, you'll find right throughout Canada, Canadian Parliament, you'll find it in Britain, you'll find it in every state of Australia, you will find it in, except Queensland. We lost our upper house under the most scandalous circumstances. <coughs> you'll find it in Canberra. It's known as the Trinitarian concept of government. Where does that come from? It comes from Christianity. What I'm trying to suggest to you is something a lot of people don't like very much. We may not be a nation of Christians, only a few people take it seriously, but we're still a Christian nation in the sense that the whole spirit in which this nation was built came from the Christian faith. All our institutions, our parliament, our parliament still stop, starts with prayer every day. Our courts, the whole thing came out of the teachings of Christ. And it seems to me when people took that seriously, we had a tremendous nation. And now we've lost the plot, the thing's going down the gurgler. And we need at least to be aware of what it is we're going to change. If you favor change, and that is your right, at least know what it is that we're throwing out. The tragedy to me is that you've got people jumping up and down saying, yes, republic, without even knowing what type or what it is we're losing. But then perhaps the most important is traditionally it was the crown that was responsible for our money. And that is why on the coins you will still find the queen's head, a little tiny remnant of a principle that has been totally abused because the money is only the petty cash now. That's the printed coins and notes. It's less than 5%, round about 5% of the total volume. 95% of our money has nothing to do with the Crown. It's been handed to a group of private banks who create it and sometimes charge us up to 30% for daring to use it. And then take our properties and get our nation into debt. And they have managed to get the whole world in debt and now say, hand your title deeds in under debt for equity swaps. And most of us are going along with this, not even knowing it's happening. So you can begin to see just where we're going. If we could begin to establish the principles we started off with and regain sovereignty over our money system, we could take this nation out. We could, we could come through this. We could have something to hand on to our kids. And that, to me, is the biggest question. 
Because like many of you, I've got two kids, three get grandkids, I wonder what's going to happen to them. And it, it, frankly, it scares me. Now, people say, boy, oh boy, you know, this is pretty heavy stuff, Jeremy Lee. What's your solution? I mean, you come round and you have these dramatic meetings and people get worked up and upset, but I mean, what are we going to do? Who are we going to vote for at the next election? I wish I could tell you, because I don't know. I think they're all pretty sick. I wish I could tell you, all you've got to do is vote for Jeremy Lee, and he'll fix it up. <laughs> You'd be stupid to believe me, and I'd be a liar if I said that. Because hidden in that statement is the implication that I'm somehow a different human being from the others. I'm not. There is no such thing as an incorruptible politician. And the principle we've learnt in our history is never trust any politician. It's a good principle. That's not to say they're bad people. Many do their best. But if you regard them as incorruptible, you're in trouble. Restrict, divide, decentralize power, and you can never really have a dictatorship, which is what we're moving to now. I wish I could say, well, I, you know, I'm not standing for Parliament, but I have got some slick, quick answers. Just go to the table, and there's instant coffee. Put it up in the cup, put on hot water, and we've got all the answers tomorrow morning. 43 beans in every cup, and all the rest of it. It's not like that. We are now moving into one of the most difficult periods in Australian history. It's going to be as just as tough and tougher than anything we had in the World Wars or any other period, the last depression. And we've got a number of disadvantages because we've lost something called the digger spirit. And we've got to rediscover that if we're going to come through. You see, whenever a nation is in trouble, two spirits appear. And you can see this in the Darwin floods or the Brisbane, the Darwin hurricane or the Brisbane floods or Ash Wednesday or some of the great crises we have, where you get that ability Australians have to get organized very quickly. They can put up first aid posts and get the injured attended to and, and they're just brilliant at that. And while that is going on, you'll find other people looting homes. We had it in Brisbane. They were swimming underwater, looting homes. We had one suburb in the Brisbane floods where the, the residents set up their own vigilante groups and you couldn't move in and out without a pass because there was so much robbery. Now, which of those spirits come through when our nation is in deep trouble and everybody's being hurt? If we can find the spirit of mateship, we're going to make it. So the only thing that I do is I run a seminar, which is a training seminar on how people can do things. It's very hard going. It takes two and a half days to get through it. And basically what happens is we come together on a Friday, we try and run it over a weekend period. We come together at half past six on a Friday evening, go right through to 10.30 at night. We come together at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning from right through to 10.30 at night, from nine in the morning to 10.30 at night. And then we come together at nine o'clock on Sunday and go right through to six. 30 solid hours of study and looking at what's going on. And people say, boy, oh boy, the whole weekend? You mean I missed the footy and mowing the lawn? And... <laughs> yep. You see, the argument is this. If we were to send troops to Vietnam before they've done some training at home, they get shot to pieces the first week. They've got to learn how to handle a gun, how to take orders, how to wear their uniform, how to move, how to read a map, how to depend on each other. And then finally, when they've gone through all that till it's right in them, they become a tremendously effective unit. But we're in another type of war. The war is for a free society. And the average person has never thought of this, doesn't know where to start. Wouldn't even know how to write a letter to a member of parliament. How to get things done. The only time we think we get things done, let's have a rally or a march or a demo. Well, they don't count much now. You can have 50,000 farmers marching through Melbourne, nothing changes. But you can get one person who's been trained on how to shift things and using certain principles can get a whole community involved and active. I've seen it done. I'll just give you one example on the Air Peninsula where one farmer who knew what to do called his community from Port Lincoln right up to Zaduna. Not only the farmers, but the businessmen and the truckies and the small shopkeepers. And they were all decimated. They were finished. 50% were broken. The banks were foreclosing. And he said, either we, we wipe our community off or else we've got to fight. 
Do we want to fight? Yeah. Are we prepared to fight for each other? Yeah. Are you prepared to fight for the person you don't like? Well, that really slowed them up. So they had a meeting in the Streaky Bay Hall, packed out, massive big country hall, and the chairman said to them <coughs> that night, if you've got anything against anybody, get it out now and let's clean it up. And they had blood all over the floor for about five hours. There were farmers who hadn't talked for three years. There were businessmen who hadn't been paid a bill by old Joe and they still resented it. There were women who passed each other in the supermarket and never spoke. There was somebody who thought that Alf's son was a dull bludger and somebody else drank too much in the park. You know, all that stuff. And it went on and on and on. And half past one in the morning, finally they said, all right, it's all cleaned up. Let's shake hands. And from here on, we stick to each other like glue. And the chairman said that night to the audience, he said, I don't know whether you've thought about it, but what we've had is a demonstration of the second commandment. You've got to love your neighbor as your friend, as yourself. We had it in the Depression. It was just called the helping hand, and everybody helped each other through the crisis. Today, we're hoping the next door business or the next door farm goes broke to make it better for us. It's a, it's a new spirit in Australia of envy and malice and fear and jealousy we don't help each other. We don't talk to each other. We've got to build that before we're going to change anything. The boss is the enemy of the worker. And you know, from that moment on, that community is stuck together and has not had one bank foreclosure in two years. Because the bank knows every time they want to put somebody into bankruptcy, they don't just take on an individual, they take on the whole community. So the banks actually come and ask permission if it's okay we foreclose on Bill because really he can't pay. And they say, well, let's go and ask Bill and if Bill wants to stay, he stays. And they get debt written off and they get conditions down to the point where Bill's got a chance. You can't do it on your own. We need each other. So we go through that. The first evening, Friday evening, we simply deal with the all that history that our kids have never learned, how Australia was put together, how the nation worked, how we got our constitution, what it means, we go through the question of what is freedom? Nobody thought of that. An alien stops you in the street from Mars and, and comes out like a robot. What is freedom? How would you answer that? Would you say freedom is to do everything you want? Or freedom is to break all the laws? Or freedom is to do your own thing? What is freedom? The only time you know about freedom is when you haven't got it. We then have a look at what's happened in 23 previous civilizations that have collapsed and why they collapsed. Every one of the same things that are happening in our society today. I might tell you, even down to the feminist movement, the drug problem, the huge growth in homosexuality, it all happened in Rome, and the fact that men became effeminate, which is the worst of the whole lot. And this is happening to Australians. Men are becoming wimps. Women are becoming tougher. <laughs> we know it, really. Going around like I do, you know, the best fighters in Australia are women. And I respect them for it, but for God's sake, let's have some men. And then on Saturday morning, we've just got one video. We've got 16 hours of video professionally done in this in half-hour lectures. It's just a, a build-up. And then we have a look at Australia as it is now, and it really makes your heart go down to your boots. And then we start on little building blocks. This is what you can do in that situation. This is what they did in the Depression, in one area where they tried to raise the rates. This is how a community saved itself in South Australia. This is what could be done in this situation and that situation. It's principle, 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 principle. How small numbers of people can change things and build up faith. And then on Saturday evening, we get on to economics and start looking at money and what could be done in that area, what we've done in the past, how we could open up Australia again. And finally, what sort of Australia would it be if we really got it back under Australian control? And do you know this is a magic country? We've got more going for us than any other nation on the face of the earth. More minerals, more food, more clothing, more energy, more natural gas, more coal, 92 out of 94 minerals known to mankind. There is not a nation on earth can touch us and we're just letting it go. 
And we show how we've got to get our kids back on side, we've got to get men and women fighting alongside each other instead of against each other. And finally, out of this comes a vision of what a tremendous country Australia could be, and that vision is motivating people. It would mean you've got to give up your whole weekend. You'd only just get back on deck in time for work on Monday morning. But the people we're getting through this, we've been running it two years, are beginning to do some excellent things because they know how things work. And my final word before I sit down and give you a go is to say this. Even with all these ideas of organization and what could be done, unless we get back to some sort of spiritual foundations and values in this country, we, we might as well give it away. Because there has never been a successful nation anywhere in the world that had not got some agreement on right and wrong and the rules by which we live. And that's what we're missing. We're all confused. And basically those are spiritual things. Now it happens, and I'm simply talking history. I'm not trying to evangelize you or preach to you. It just happens that the whole of this nation that we've got, which even today with all its problems is still a tremendous nation. You don't find Australians rowing across to Vietnam as refugees. They still want to come here because we've got something. <laughs> all this, all this build up, which you'll find right throughout Europe and North America, came out of the teachings of one person who lived 2,000 year, years ago on earth for a, a, for a very brief period. He actually only operated in a teaching mode for 36 months. Never had a political party, was never a politician or a king or an emperor or a general, had an army or a spear, had no power mechanisms, not even a newspaper or a newsletter. The only way he could communicate was just walk along dusty roads up and down an obscure part on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. A little gaggle of 12 fishermen walking along behind who really hadn't got the first clue what he was talking about. And one of those was a traitor. But what he said in that 36 months was so brilliant that it changed the whole course of human nature. The whole of history changed because a new concept came in that had never been thought of before. And that concept was very simple, that we are responsible for each other. And the word was, you've got to love each other. Not sloppy stuff, but responsible for the people around us, our brothers, our sisters, the people in our community. And this revolutionized thinking people had never conceived of that. The only way you ran things was with the weight of the spear in your hand up to the left. And now this new idea. And men, brilliant lawyers and constitutional experts got together and tried to work out how do we build this new idea into a new way of living. And out of that came Australia and Britain, Canada, America. If what he said was that brilliant, what about some of the other things he said? The most startling of which was the claim that he was not merely a human being. He was God himself. Which is the most outrageous thing anybody could ever say. And it was enough to get him murdered. And then, having got him out of the way, so they thought, this stark, raving person who said things like that, hundreds of people said they saw him alive again. And not only that, but because it was so absolutely uh, mind-blowing, they had to touch him to make sure he was there. He was there all right. And that opens up incredible possibilities. It opens up the fact that there is a power there. And that if a nation is humble enough to get into the right position, things will change. I don't think, frankly, this necessarily has much to do with what we perceive to be churches today. Who wouldn't have a clue about a lot of this? But it's there all right. And anybody who really looks for it can find it. And if we look for it and tap into it, things do swing round. And if Australia does it, it's going to come through. If it doesn't, down the go. And we've got to get started if we want anything for our children at all, because we haven't got very much time. Thank you.